All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Protect Your Neck podcast. I'm your host, Dan Tom. Analyst whose work you could find over at MMA Junkie as well as linemovement.com. But on this year program, the Protect Your Neck podcast, we break down high level MMA. That's what we're going to do here today in a slightly different way, kind of bringing you more of these interview programs as you hopefully see us on YouTube as well as hello on audio. As I'm bringing on someone I've always wanted to talk to, maybe we'll have him back on down the road for a top five if he's not uh, completely sick of me after today, but he, he is the man, he is Tommy Elliott, or as you know him on Twitter, at Moy underscore Cowboy. Uh, that's of course M-U-A-Y underscore K-H-A-O-B-O-Y. He contributes to the fight site, the fight dash site.com, which you should also be following what is up, Tommy? Oh, man, it's good to be here on a Friday afternoon to talk a little grappling and MMA. Yeah, exactly. That's what we're going to do. Uh, not just an interview, so to speak, uh, although I do want to learn about you. And, uh, you know, t- t- Tommy, you know, you might not, you know, uh, be, you know, a-, a UFC fighter or, you know, some uh, ADCC winner, but you are more qualified to speak on a lot of the things that I speak about that most of us uh, stand and fan about. So what better place to bring you on than to here to to tackle some topics that I really have been wanting to, you know, that that have been scratching at me, Tommy. It sounds like you have a lot of opinions um, about the guard in MMA. That's what we're going to tether our conversation to today. I've got some thoughts for sure. But before we get there, Tommy, I want to learn a bit about you and um, a bit about not just your jujitsu, but also your judo background. We'll bridge, yeah, sure. we'll bridge judo because I do want to get some thoughts on there as far as judo and MMA. And we'll obviously, the, 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 the main course is um, guard systems. We're going to be talking a little turtle, a little, little uh, K-control, a little bit of a shoulder pin slash Williams guard, mm-hmm. depending on how you are familiar with it. So uh, before we get there, Tommy, you contribute to a site um, that I like a lot, thefightsite.com. They do a lot of good work mm-hmm. there. Um, and we'll talk about your TELUS article in due time, but how did you, how did you get into this point, man? It sounds like you've been doing martial arts for a long time before you became a fan of MMA. What came first, the chicken or the egg? Tell us how that happened. So I started martial arts. Well, I, I started as a really little kid doing, uh, karate and taekwondo that didn't last very long. Um, I wrestled, uh, some in, uh, in middle school, um, but when I really started uh, started the journey was uh, in 1996, uh, when I think I was a freshman in high school, um, <clears throat> I was really, really into martial arts movies. And I was also really, really into early UFCs, because this would have been, uh, yeah, it's about 96. And, um, you know, you could go down to Blockbuster, which existed then, and you could get tapes of, uh, you know, the early UFCs and all these, uh, you know, kung fu movies. And I, there was, like, no separation in my mind between the two. Uh, it's like, oh, you know, yeah, Jet Li... Hoist Gracie, whatever, cool. I'm gonna get it. I probably watched a VHS of UFC six 20 times, um, which is why I love like Tektaro so much. But uh, but in any case, I, I started doing uh, Korean martial arts because that was what was available at the time. So um, I have a black belt in Hapkido, um, a red belt in Taekwondo, and uh, I did that for quite a while. Uh, not really competitive. I, I was at a very very traditional school, but then when I started college in 2000, uh, my my uh, school, Indiana University, uh, had has an enormous um, martial arts program as part of their curriculum. So you could take credit for classes in like judo and jujitsu and aikido and like a ton of different martial arts. Um, and so I did a little bit of everything. But what I really got into th- at that point was judo. And as soon as I started doing it and actually throwing people and getting choked, um, it became much harder to uh, to spend any time on hapkido and taekwondo because it's like oh, that's this is this is real real stuff. Um, you know, this, these, these people could legitimately kick my ass and I could not stop them. It's not theoretical. Um, and so I just started training, uh, judo extremely intensely, um, competed all the time. Um, it was a fairly successful judo competitor. Probably my, my best showing was coming in seventh at collegiate nationals, um, which sounds more impressive than it is. There's not a huge college judo scene in the United States. So that's not that big of a deal, but, um, it was, it was a good achievement and, uh, you know, won a lot of local tournaments, um, won a uh, AAU Junior National Championship, which used to be a, a bigger deal. It was still kind of a big deal when I did it, but I was never a top-flight uh, judoka. 
Um, but I was a competitive guy and, uh, you know, I could, I could pick up a match here or there against good people. Um, so, uh, I did that very, very intensely. And as I was practicing judo, um, I became more interested in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, I'm from Indiana and there wasn't a lot of BJJ at the time in the early two thousands there. Um, but what there was, there, there was actually a, a guy who was coming and teaching classes on uh, campus. It was a purple belt, but at the time that was a really big deal in the Midwest. There, there were not purple belts or brown belts. There were like three black belts in the Midwest and they all lived in Chicago. Um, so <clears throat> it was a, it was a really big deal to be able to train under a purple belt. And I got super into jujitsu, uh, at first just to help my judo. Um, uh, but then eventually just fell in love with, uh, with the art for itself. Um, I had a lot of injury problems related to judo and ended up having to, to stop it for, for some time in the mid, um, aughts, but, uh, never really completely stopped doing jujitsu. And when I really came back to martial arts intensely, after I'd kind of cleared up some of my injuries around 2010 or so, um, it was almost all jujitsu and I just threw myself into it. I trained, I competed all the time. Uh, I was a better ju uh, jujitsu competitor than a judo one. I, uh, I still was no, nobody on the national level, but I consistently won at the, at the regional level and would compete. I, I would compete uh, the few times I went up to national levels, but um, never, never medaled or anything like anything I do JJF. Um, one and one in fight to win pro. So I have, I have competed professionally a couple of times though. Um, that came around when I was a little older and, and kind of passed my athletic prime and also to a point in my life where I wasn't training quite as hard. Um, but you know, it was fun. And, um, still still train as much as i can when uh we're not having a pandemic and um i teach quite a bit uh and now i also write for the fight site primarily on um, on grappling uh, though i do write there sometimes on uh well grappling and mma for a, a lot uh, i do write pure grappling articles i'll occasionally write some kickboxing stuff i have i have kickboxed for years uh muay thai um i'm an extremely unsuccessful kickboxer oh and two as an amateur um but i love it and i do it a lot i've i've spend a lot of time doing it, trying to get good at it and learn about it as, as much about it as I can. And uh, I, I do enjoy uh, writing about Muay Thai and kickboxing a lot too. So that's pretty much where I'm at right now. I, you know, I've, I've been involved in, in martial arts and, and MMA and Jiu Jitsu and Muay Thai for uh, the better part of 25 years. And uh, I, I couldn't, uh, couldn't imagine not doing it. That's awesome, man. So you skipped amateur, you just went right to, I'm going to go pro, I'm going to try pro. And, uh, and uh, you, you just, just, just just why not, or did, uh, was that? Or what? Uh, MMA, you said, right? One, you went one and one, or? No, 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 no. I'm I'm zero and two in amateur Muay Thai. Oh, okay, okay. I, I thought you said you went no, one I've and never, one. Pro. I, I did in, in fight to win pro professional grappling. Oh, okay. I got you. I got so, you. So yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, sorry if that was confusing. No, yeah, no, no so, worries. Um, I've done a few pro grappling events, and uh, you know maybe I'll do some more when uh, when we get done with this pandemic. I was gonna say you're a big guy, Tommy. I wouldn't blame you uh, for just going straight to pro because. I, I, I aimed to be one and one as an amateur fighter. Unfortunately, I got as zero and one, and as people know, I sustained um, my my lasting uh, concussion effects in my camp for my second fight. Oh man! But um, but I used to I used to joke and like, do I should I really be cutting the forty fives and fifty fives? These guys are fast and technical. Why don't I just eat a little bit and hang out at eighty five? You know, uh, <laughs> and you look at heavyweight, right? Like you look at heavyweight. Like I used to watch Khalil Roundtree fights in the UFC, and he yeah. would just be washing guys at heavyweight, which a lot of middleweights and light heavyweights did on the regional scenes. Um, mm -hmm. and because the talent level is just as, as you kind of go higher in weight. So I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking like, Oh, a a athletic Tommy Elliott here with the judo background. I'm like, this guy would wash regional heavyweights. Yeah. I would go straight to pro too. <laughs> well, maybe if I was a little younger, uh, if I was as good as I am now and, uh, 20 years younger or even 15 years younger, I would. Um, but you know, nearing 40 with two kids and a, a real job, um, Fighting, fighting professionally is not really in the cards at this point. I, I kind of miss my window, but that's okay. Um, I, I enjoy uh, the training. I enjoy grappling competition a lot, and um, you know, certainly enjoy teaching now as well. Teaching is awesome. It's a great thing. It's something that I, I'm very passionate about. So I, I sentiment you with that, and I also sentiment with you as we round the conversation back into grappling. But yes, rounding ourselves as we get older. I was very reluctant to put on the gi. Uh, maybe it was because of my disenfranchisement of my own upbringing through, from woo-woo martial arts to, you know, and we even see a little bit of that, you know, w w which we don't have to get into here. But, you know, some of the culture, let's just say, in, in some Brazilian jiu-jitsu or anything with the gi or there's, there's reverence, you, you kind of run that risk. But uh, Yeah, you do. But, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not trying to downtrot uh, the art or, or, or our conversation because I, I love grappling. 
But as you know, back to what you said, as we get older, I think that's what I'm going to round myself. So I'm going to get on the Tommy Elliott plan. I'm, I'm, I'm a few years behind, but I look at someone like you and I'm like, this guy looks healthy. He's, he's still killing it. And uh, I'm going to try to earn myself uh, another black belt. But uh, that was awesome yeah. to hear your story and how you got to yours. And uh, I, I've, I was always curious to hear that, man. That, that makes a whole lot of sense because you know a whole lot of what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I like to consider myself a, a student of the, the game. Even when I was a purple belt, brown belt, um, I, I started organizing a lot of my own training just because most jiu-jitsu schools are not really set up to make people better past about purple belt. Um, and so, you know, through my black belt, most of the training I did, and my instructor was very supportive of this, but was with other uh, higher level folks within the gym and within uh, the community where I live. Um, and, uh, you know, we just get together a few brown belts, a few black belts, and we just drill and train for hours. And that's, that's how, I, how I kept getting better from purple belt through black belt. Um, it's very hard to get better past purple belt just going to class, unless you're at just an, an absolute top school. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And a lot of things go into that. Like uh, for me, a lot of mine was mindset. It wasn't until I started being analytical to where I actually got better. So now even though my training is more sparse and sporadic, I feel like perhaps with a more mature mind, I think something you kind of led on to, it's almost like an advantage now if you can keep yourself, you know, physically able enough, of course, to perform. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I'm doing a, a close quarantine group with guys who, um, you know, who have kind of taken this whole thing seriously, not to timestamp this episode too much. But yes, folks, we are in the pandemic era. Um, uh, but the good the good thing about that, Tommy, and I'm finding that too, and, and like, you know, I'm training with the black belt who, who ran one of the classes at Extreme Couture, mm -hmm. who I cited earlier. Um, there's a couple brown belts and pretty much just purple belts and up, right? And because we're actually able to focus drilling, you're not having the class format and the kind of catching everybody up and keeping everybody on the same pace, making sure they're tracking, when you kind of can alleviate a lot of that, I, we're all kind of been noticing that we've been learning uh, exponentially more at our different levels. Yeah. Well, it also allows you to focus on a, on a much smaller number of things, right? When you're a white belt and a blue belt, it makes sense to just collect techniques because you don't know anything, right? You just need to go through the curriculum. You need to learn the breadth of jujitsu. By the time you get to purple belt, brown belt, like, you know what it's about. And so at that point, you can look at a technique and you can say, well, is this something I will actually use or not? If it's not, you're a good enough grappler that you have it in your back pocket. If the situation arises, you can use it, but it's not something you want to train every day. And you certainly don't want to go to class one day and that's all you train. Well, if you're just training on your own, if you're training with a core group of good guys, you can say something like, I am going to work on my leg locks for the next three months and do it. Um, I mean, I got good at leg locking by working with another guy on almost nothing else for about six hours a week for yeah. a year and a half. And that's, that's how you get good at stuff. Yeah, so. that was my two, just drilling, drilling, drilling. Fortunately, yeah. my MCL, PCL, and ACLs have, have some damage to, and stories they can tell now from it um, because also it was from a little bit of a, uh, you know, a, a lot of highest end uh, lineage um, with, with Neil Melanson there. Yeah. But what I did like about with Neil, um, aside from the rough trading aspect, which I would say was maybe more the – the negative, you know, I guess, but that's that's kind of catch wrestling as opposed to jujitsu. A lot of catch wrestlers pride themselves on being a little more rough. But what I did like about Neil's teaching is that it was a lot of touching on what you're touching on, Tommy. It was concepts over technique. And I'm a big, I'm more of a thinker. And from a being a thinker to a doer to somebody who even, which might sound asinine being that, um, you know, th um, my ranking isn't that high, but at a certain time would cover and teach intermediate as well as the basic grappling classes for a time back in 2013 or 2014 at Extreme Couture or 20, 2012 actually, it was a while ago. But my classes, it was never, you, you were gonna get a bunch of people that were better than me to teach you how to close off a triangle choke, how to set up a triangle choke, um, how to do these techniques. I was always gonna work from, we'll talk a bit about turtle positions, re-wrestling in, half guard, uh, a lot of core positions and concepts that were gonna serve as connecting pieces because I feel like that could serve someone more well, then they could build on to whatever style they wanted to from there. Whereas, you know, some, some teachers and coaches will, will give you not just techniques over concepts, but you'll almost look at their whole students as a whole and you'll see the same stuff funneled and kind of repeated. And I don't know if that's, that's the best thing. I don't know if I'm going on a tangent there or not, but. Uh, you know, I, I get a little frustrated sometimes with the concepts versus technique discussion because, you know, you, you get in these discussions with the white belts and like, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to spend all this time in these moves. I want to learn concepts. It's like, well, 
you're you're putting the cart before the horse. True. Because if you are, let's say you're writing, like you have to have a vocabulary before we can start talking about sentence structure and paragraph structure and chapter structure and like how to write. So learning techniques and learning a lot of learning the technique well is the vocabulary of grappling. Now, once you have that down, you the concepts reveal themselves to a certain extent. You know, you take something like an, like the open elbow, right? So you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, talking yeah. About the open elbow. Yes, the space so, there. Yeah. Yeah. So if I just tell a white belt or even a blue belt, like anytime you see the open elbow, you can you can go for a kimura. Like that's not something they can really process. But if I teach them the kimura and make them do kimura entries, you know, a thousand times, and then I say hey, you know, anytime you see the open elbow, like anytime this condition is met, you can do this thing that you just practiced a lot. That's when it becomes effective for them. Um, And I think that a lot of it too comes down to strategy. So one of the things that a lot of coaches don't talk about much, but that I think is extremely important in jujitsu pedagogy is positional strategy. It's not just moves. It's like, okay, I'm in this position. What am I trying to do? Like, what is my goal here? And it's not... It can't be something like to submit the guy. It needs to be something like, well, I'm going to attack the arm and I'm either going to get the arm or it's going to give me the opening to get the knee in and go to bound. Right. So it's these these small combinations of of moves that um, that lead to a coherent strategy where you just have your cues and you just know what to do in every position. Uh, this is why Lloyd Irvin, as much as an asshole as he is and a terrible person, produces such effective students because that's how he teaches. He teaches with with cues. Like you're in this position, like do this thing. Start there and then that leads to other to other branches. It can't be too long, you know, you can't do like this 15 move combination because that's unrealistic, but um, just knowing like yeah, when I try this, he can defend and it opens up these other options um, is extremely valuable. Danaher talks about this all the time. He talks about it in the context of dilemmas. That's what he always calls his dilemmas, right? Putting people in unwinnable situations where they're screwed regardless of what their reaction is. But it's all the, it's all the same notion. Um, and I think people who develop those positional strategies get really good because um, they, they just become faster because they recognize the position faster. They go to their options faster and they transition off their options faster. This is how you get good at like winning scrambles, right? Yeah. Um, sorry, that's a long tangent, but um, I, I think that's an extremely important thing for people to focus on in positions is, yeah, there's a lot of moves, but what do you want to do? Like, how do you want to approach this position? What's the main thing you're looking for? And then based on the main reactions your opponent can have, what's your next move? See, that's why I have you on here, Tommy. You explain it so much better than me when I talk about concepts versus positions. And that's a very interesting point. And yeah, you, you, uh, I didn't clarify it enough, so that's good that you did. You don't want to put the cart before the horse. You know, you need to have that vocabulary and kind of hours on the mat. In fact, anybody, you know, anything that you could credit my game to, it's not because I'm good. It's because I've been beat up a lot from these positions and have been forced the hard way to learn it, but not just the self-deprecating answer. It's It comes down to those reps, and without that reps and vocabulary, like you said, um, it's hard to build build upon that. And we were just talking about the open elbow and not just open elbow, but behind the elbow um, to the tricep. You know, if you can ever get get here, you essentially have someone's back. You know, and which is a whole nother kind of heady, a heady thing that would you know you would tell that to a white belt. They'd be like, what, what are you talking about? What behind the yeah. elbow? You know, and and there's just a whole concept there. But you like you said, you you have to have that vocabulary first. So that that's definitely very important. I guess I just kind of came up in an era where it was like everyone was trying to find the cool submission. And, you know, this is like, you know, late aughts, early 2010s where it's all about flashy shit. So I really, and me being a contrarian, like just kind of hate that style. So I almost kind of overcorrect and talk too much concept and can be very guilty. It's a bad style. You know? Yeah. It's a bad style. And I mean, I, I, that sounds very judgy and and it is, but um, it's, any style that works really well up to about purple belt and then stops working as you get better and works worse and worse as you get higher up the ranks is not a good style. Um, and that's, that's gimmicky stuff. That's what it does. I, now there, I will say there are things that seem gimmicky at first that end up not being gimmicky. You know, when the Baron Bolo first hit the competition jujitsu scene, everyone's like, Oh, like what the hell is this? Like, this is some stupid gimmick. Like, and now actually this is pretty fundamentally sound and, and it works pretty well. And the guy doesn't have to make huge mistakes for it to work. Like you can force this on somebody. Um, so this is not a, about not trying new things. It's that if you learn some weird choke that you have to like let a guy get halfway past your guard before you can hit it, and that and you decide I'm going to build my game on this because every white belt I roll with I catch, 
eh, you're, you're, you're going in the wrong direction. A- absolutely. And, and not to sound, uh, I don't know if trite's the right word, but like, uh, you know, or, or not, not to cite, I guess, the obvious, like, you know, um, I don't even know if this is a Roganism, but it's just so commonplace in commentary where they say, you know, there's a reason why Damian Mayo or Hicks and Gracie, they do the same things every time. Uh, you know, or they're not doing something fancy. They're playing, you know, very basic positions or from they're operating from the half guard as their home base. There is some truth to that. I mean, it, it, it's kind oh, of yeah. beaten. It's beaten and it's a broad brush to paint with, sure. But that doesn't mean there's not truth to that. Back to what you're saying. Um, but hey, you know, speaking of things that kind of get overinflated, uh, if you will, or maybe they aren't overinflated, and time has to tell these things. Judo. Uh, this is the connecting yes. piece of this conversation. Obviously, I'm 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 a, I'm a fan of that. I come from the you know, uh, Neil's the only black belt under Caro Parisian, and of course we're gonna cite Caro here when talking and tethering our conversation to MMA. He was the guy that kind of brought it on the scene for many of us where we entered our fandom, uh, where the sport was growing, and those. Big tosses on Diego Sanchez are still fun to go back and look at. I'm oh not gosh. I'm not trying to take away from those, but the judo players from back in the day, it's, it's always been pretty sparse. You know, you've got, you know, Dong Young, Dong Young Kim, uh, welterweight, uh, another welterweight there. Of course, you know, you had uh, R- R- Ronda Rousey was the more popular ones. You had like, was Poppy a Betty a judo guy? You had these guys that kind of popped up. Of course, not Lombard a is a big one. one. Probably, uh, heck, yeah, I was going to say Hector Lombard is, is probably the other really good example. If you want to go into pride, uh, Yoshida, uh, Hideo Hill Yoshida was uh, oh, yeah, of course. actually an Olympic an Olympic gold medalist and an extremely good judoka. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's they're, they're fairly few and uh, far between. A few more on the Japanese side. You know, Shinya Aoki is like a second or third degree black belt in judo. Uh, but I, I don't, that's not the core of his game. You know, if you've watched some Shinya fights, you know that. So <laughs> it, it is a, a style that you don't see a ton of in MMA. Um, and I do think that there's some there's some pretty pretty clear reasons for that. Um, you know, if you, you got to start first of all with the culture of judo, which is that um, you know when you look at Brazilian jiu jitsu, it's very intimately connected to fighting, and it always has been. Um, wrestling is approached very much as a like a straight competitive sport, and there's there's very much a, a rough aspect to it, at least in the U.S. And that's it's true everywhere. It's probably more true in the way uh, Americans approach it, uh, but uh in judo you don't you don't have that so much right? right like yes it's a sport and guys train it very seriously as a sport but the culture of it is still very much kind of an old school martial arts culture where it's supposed to be more about about values and um, uh, mutual respect and benefit which is actually one of the slogans of judo and judo as uh, organizationally has always strongly discouraged participation in mma um, the ijf uh, which controls international judo the olympics and the world championship systems um is very anti-mma um and i don't i don't think there's anything in their stance that softened uh, over the last several years on that uh since i last looked um so you don't really have this pool of talent from judo that's coming into mma because really good judoka focus on their judo they don't they don't look to cross over. And if they do, it's often way at the end of their careers where they're just, it's just not effective. You know, if you, you look at um, another uh, guy who fought a couple times in pride is uh, uh, Pavel Nastula, a uh, Polish judoka who was, I, I want to say a multiple time world champion and an Olympic medalist. I don't know if he was a gold medalist or not off the top of my head, but very accomplished judoka. And, um, you know, you watch his MMA fights, it really didn't look like he tried to learn much MMA. And he was too old when he did it to, to really commit to it and, and have a good run. Um, and that's pretty common. Uh, you know, even Hector Lombard was not young when he switched right. over to, to MMA. And I think if he'd started in the UFC, he probably wouldn't have had the success that he had running through uh, people in Bellator. Um, so that's that's a big part of it. Uh, you know, if you look at wrestlers in MMA, a lot of the successful wrestlers are not guys who have had extensive uh, international careers. You know, you get some, Daniel Cormier, Randy Couture, but uh, a lot of them are guys coming out of college, right? yep. coming out of American collegiate programs. They're still young. They're in great shape. It takes them a while to learn MMA, but they take the time to do it. There's camps that are really good now at turning uh, collegiate wrestlers into MMA fighters. No no uh, structure like that exists for judo. Um, so I think that's a big part of it is just you don't have this, uh, this pipeline and, and the culture of it doesn't um, promote MMA. The other thing is, of course, judo is a gi sport, and it is an extremely um, gi-reliant sport. You cannot do judo without a gi. If you do, you are just doing upper body wrestling. Um, and 
judo guys never do that. You know, in, in jiu-jitsu, you take off your gi some of the times, you roll no gi, and frankly, there's less separation between the gripping and the positions, um, at least historically, that's less true now, but uh, that you need between gi and no gi. Uh, but in judo, nobody ever trains without the gi, practically speaking. And if they were to, <laughs> then they would realize it is an entirely different world. Um, nobody ever trains with strikes in judo. Uh, it's all very, you know, focused on just throwing and a limited amount of groundwork. And, um, you know, that kind of training just doesn't lend itself very well to, to crossing over to MMA. Um, so, you know, I, I think that if you're at a school like Hyastan, I don't think it's a coincidence that both Caro and, and Ronda were Hyastan people, right. uh, because that is a more fighting oriented school. You know, you had guys like yeah. Gene LaBelle hanging around, right? And yeah. you know, many guys who were fighters yeah. and who were about grappling in fighting. Um, so, and, and even in her international career, Ronda Rousey won a lot more matches on the ground with her Nawaz than she did standing right. because that was the strength of her and that school. Um, so I think that the, the mentality of judo as a martial art and the culture surrounding it, and then also the, the techno, technical repertoire and the practice methodologies of the vast majority of judoka neither lend themselves well to, uh, to MMA. Um, and, you know, if you look too at kind of what's considered aesthetically pleasing and beautiful in judo. It's not like muscling people around and, and forcing them into a throw. It's carefully setting them up. It's using motion and, and movement to try and catch them on a half beat, you know, as they're stepping when they're slightly off balance and then throw them in this big spectacular throw. That's a uh, very high risk. If you're in MMA, you know, uh, all these throws are turning throws where you're turning your back towards them. And, um, you know, that's just, just not something that really translates well to uh, to MMA. Um, I think there's a small amount of uh, judo technique that works extremely well uh, for mixed martial arts, but it's not the stuff that most judoka spend most of their time practicing on because it's not generally the highest scoring stuff in judo. Right, yeah, and I like that you brought up the style difference, not just within judo, but within wrestling too, because you know a lot of the theory, at least, you know, with, with a folk style translating better, you get more... You get more better mat wrestlers, you know, because they're having to you do did. it more. Or they're, they're, the, the game and the rules emphasize upon it more. Um, whereas judo, like you said, it doesn't necessarily have to be a part of your style. But if it is, like with Rousey and the victory she was getting with the Nawaza, you can excel there. Of course, the common and layman answer that I often give, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but yes, competition judo, I don't... I haven't followed the lineage. I used to have the history down. I think 1925 gets recognized or something like 1965. I forget. I used to have the dates down, but uh, I, haven't, I haven't kept up with the rulings. But traditionally, uh, and you, you correct me here if I'm wrong, Tommy, it doesn't allow for prolent, uh, prolonged or extended ground fighting uh, for, for, for the layman uh, wanting to know more about competition judo and perhaps why that part, we don't see that translation more. <clears throat> So that's changed some over the years. Okay. Um, back when judo was very young, in the in really the 20s or the 40s, there was more groundwork. Um, one thing you'll hear people talk about a lot, uh, judo guys with kind of an intermediate amount of knowledge is kosen judo, um, which is a very... You'll occasionally hear people who don't know what they're talking about say that Brazilian jiu-jitsu came from kosen judo. This is not true. What kosen judo actually is, is it's a, um, it's a rule set utilized by seven uh, technical universities um, in Japan that they have used to compete amongst themselves for many, many years that has a very heavy emphasis on groundwork. So you can see all the, you can see these old Japanese kosen judo matches um, where guys are doing like crazy guard stuff that you wouldn't see again until the nineties in jujitsu. Um, but that was not, that was not mainstream uh, judo. So, you know, the mainstream judo was focusing more on stand up and throwing. They did allow more time on the ground. Uh, once you started hitting the Olympic period in um, the sixties, seventies, that got de-emphasized and they gradually, they, they took it out more and more and more. Um, the eighties. And a lot of this is just kind of like, Ref, how referees treated things, right? So it's not necessarily really formal. You can just see these kind of trends in refereeing because referees have a tremendous amount of discretion in judo about when to stop the action. Um, in the 80s, you would see a little bit more groundwork. It kind of went away again in the 90s. Uh, actually, in probably the last 10 years, they've been allowing more and more mat time, which has been really nice. You've actually seen some folks like uh, Travis Stevens, who's the most successful uh, recent judo male judo for the United States. Um, won almost all of his matches in the Rio Olympics on the ground, basically by passing people's guards. Like, 
smash passes from happening. Nice. Um, and you have to pass guard a very specific way because if you stand up too much, they'll stop the action. So you almost like have to do these low line passes. If you watch his matches, it's crazy because you can see him just doing like these Bernardo Faria style, um, you know, really low level um, uh, guard passes, and it's it's fantastic to watch. So the refs are essentially are, are so finicky in judo matches. Are you saying they're like the equivalent to uh, NBA refs, but in the martial arts world? A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of discretion that goes on. Um, and, but, you know, it, it kind of comes and goes. And the emphasis on judo has always been on the big throw. Right. That's just that, – that's what judo is about um, as a sport is throwing the guy with force and control on his back flat for a, an immediate win. An, an upon is what it's called. Upon, single point. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's, that's where judo is at. And, um, and I guess my last thing on judo um, is uh, – well, one is – more modern day guys we see and, and perhaps is less common like like the Brett Johns of the world or guys maybe with their judo still has a stronger base uh, schools uh, you know depending what region you're fighting from but even those guys who are successful with their grappling they're using a lot of wrestling or MMA based wrestling <laughs> techniques when you really um, break it down um, I, I guess that's that's probably not really a surprise to you as we see these skill sets transition into modern day MMA right? No not at all you know if you if you kind of look at how you win a judo match, if you hit somebody with a big throw, it does not matter at all what position you end up in on the ground. doesn't matter a bit. You just, you win. You throw them hard on their back, you win. Right. Um, so what that means is that, and, and also if you fail the throw and you end up turtled up on your knees with the guy on top of you, if you can be defensive enough for like 10 seconds, the ref will stop it and you get back up. So you have a lot of people whose whole style is completely, in fact, I would say probably the, the maybe not the majority, but a, a sizable piece of judoka. Their style is entirely to try and set up and sell out on the huge throw. If they get it, they win. And if they don't, that they try to stall out until they can get back to the feet. This is the worst possible stand-up grappling style for MMA. Right. And, you know, you want the lowest risk technique that le that if you screw it up, you're you're in a perfect, you're in a safe defensible defensible position, or you can bail out halfway, right? Um, and that is just not how people practice judo. If you look at the judo stuff that works really well in MMA, a lot of it's the foot sweeps, um, or the throws that don't involve as big of a turn. So you know, tripping tripping throws, um, what you would call um, uh, an outs, uh, let's see, an outside trip in wrestling, uh, inside trips in wrestling very common judo techniques um, and among the better judo techniques for uh, for cage uh, cage grappling and, and I guess I, I lied last thing here um, and it'll be quick because I'm a poor podcaster Tommy and I don't have my notes and names to cite however I did write an article in my defense that I'm gonna cite as I pose this to you now but we mentioned Hector Lombard um, I would argue he's probably one of the more successful guys when you look at overall MMA career to even his uh, submission grappling, he's a guy who, you know, uh, tried to... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, oh, you're man, good. I had a, a poor connection for just a moment. I, I missed about 10 seconds of what you said. All good, all good. Uh, Hector Lombard, I'm bringing it back around to. Yeah. I would argue he is a guy who, as far as Judicas and MMA go, um, successful both in MMA and submission grappling. He's an MMA mm -hmm. fighter who competes more than an average MMA fighter, as much less Judicas um, who fight MMA. Uh I have I had a theory because I, I had to write an article for Flow Combat on one of the first submission undergrounds. Hector didn't end up competing, but I chose to take the angle of Cuban judo. And I'm a history and martial arts nerd, obviously. And I unlocked this crazy world of knowledge I didn't realize. You know, uh, you know, everyone wants to talk about the Brazilian jiu-jitsu connection, of course. You know, uh, of course, uh, uh, Maeda. You know, t yeah, teaching teaching the Gracies. But if you, you track Maeda's travels, he actually stopped over in Cuba. When he was a part of, you know, a pro wrestling circuit, if you will. I don't know if they called it a pro wrestling circuit back then, by the way, folks. Um, but he stopped over in there uh, uh, and and actually was responsible for a lot of the birth, according to a lot of literature I read, as far as Cuban judo. And Cuban, whether we're talking about boxing, taekwondo, for whatever reason, they have a nice twang on their martial arts. And it yeah. wasn't just uh, Maeda. There was another guy, I believe, was it Andreas Kolechkin, if I'm pronouncing the name incorrectly? the guy who they credit as a, one of a, a, the godfathers to judo, and another Japanese gentleman around the 1917 to 1920 period actually traveled there to influence Cuba as well. But it, but essentially, these stylists were much more uh, Nawaza friendly, I guess, for, yeah. you know, more, more ground fighting friendly for layman's turns. And 
if you watch, and I want to get your opinion because I'm I'm very ignorant, but from 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 me watching in comparison uh, to Cuba, to you were saying, you know, d- between America and Japan. Well, when I look at Cuba in the mix, they seem to have their own kind of swagger, if you will, to their style. Am I completely off base with the bullshit I'm spouting here, or, or what? No, no. You know, you you might well know more about the history of uh, Cuban judo than I do. You probably do, actually, but. Um... You know, not to make a, an extremely broad generalization, but uh, uh, communists are really good at grappling. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, right, it's true. And, and that's that's not that's not just a, a joke, but uh, because it, I think one of the reasons that Cuba has the judo that they do is because of the the interchange that they had with the Soviet Union. And if you look at the judo of, of the Soviet Union. Um, it has just such a heavy influence from the fact that all those guys were also wrestlers without the gi. A lot of them had a lot of training in native styles, um, especially guys from Georgia and Armenia. And um, that all fed into a very syncretic judo style that um, that involved a lot of groundwork, that involved a lot more of a wrestling approach. Um, a lot of rule changes have actually made it harder to play in that kind of old Soviet style. But if you go back and watch uh, matches from the seventies involving Soviet judoka. They're taking all these weird grips that are much more like wrestling, you know, stuff like two on ones and using a lot more like body lock kind of things. Um, and, uh, it, it looks a lot, it's, it's a kind of grappling that it's a lot more effective in MMA, frankly. Right. Um, and, but it's because in, as far as I can tell, and I'm sure there are people, there are people who are much more expert on this than, than me, but to make a generalization based upon what I've seen, there's simply much less separation between different grappling styles um, in the former Soviet republics and also in um, some, some of their satellite countries like Cuba um, than there is in, in the U.S. You know, in the U.S., you might be a wrestler or, or a judoka. I've known a lot of people who did both, but it's usually they wrestled first and then they did judo when they got older. Um, whereas there, it's people like Habib who have competed in, in a lot of styles and, right. and know all kinds of different things. And um, there's just much less uh, separation and division between the styles, so there's a lot more technical influence um, and cross-pollination between, the, between them. That tie-in actually makes a ton of sense. You know, I also get a lot, my hands on a lot of the UFC bios they send out for these guys. Yeah. And it's great because not a lot of media on these caucus or Russian fighters. And a lot of the times with the Sambo and wrestling, you will see judo credentials mixed in there. But they're not overtaking, uh, they're not tainting their style from watching them fight in, in, in the traditional ways, so to speak. So that kind of makes a little more sense, that tie-in, that, that, that tie-in there, Tommy. Wow, see, I, I learned a lot on the judo aspect. Hopefully you folks did too. We're going to push on to the last segment here, which is kind of unique guard play. Uh, a big reason why I wanted to have you on, and again, for plugging the uh, fight site, was because you guys did an article. You did an article, Tommy, and one of my favorites, Eduardo Tellez. I was never a good wrestler uh, you know, in, in open space, in neutral space, uh, as our friend uh, Ed Gallo would say. Um, but my grappling style was very wrestling-based. I find myself using a lot of top position, grinding, shoulder position, floating position. Um, and subsequently just being, which you laid great context, I didn't realize as far as how Tellez came up. But coming up in the grappling rooms that I did, which was deceptively tough, I certainly I certainly would have been the bottom in all cases, my friends. Uh, you end up having a fight from really bad positions. And I found myself having to fight from Turtle, and uh, not to just keep you know using his name, but Neil Melanson came up to me and said, you know, you should look up this guy, Eduardo Tellis. He said, I'm going to assign that to you, Dan, uh, you know, about 10 years ago. He said, I want you to go home and watch Tellis footage. You're going to thank me later. And I did, and I still use his stuff. Um, were you a fan of his, or was this just something that was uh, pitched to the fight site, and you're like, you know what, I can tackle this? So a little bit of both. Um, we actually had a, uh, a Patreon request. So anybody who's listening who's not a Fight Site patron, uh, you should go check us out on Patreon.com. Uh, not only will we uh, do we write articles on the basis of the suggestion of our patrons, write articles and videos. Um, we also have a Discord, which is very very active, where um, you know some, in my opinion, some of the best MMA discussion and um, combat sports discussion uh, you can find anywhere available only to patrons. But uh, we had a patron request for. Um, it was on. He asked on a number of styles, uh, but one of the, but it, the structure of it was he wanted uh, an article on uh, the greatest, an article on the specialist, and an article on a weird guy from all these different combat sports. And um, my colleague Ben Cohn trained under Marcelo Garcia, so he got to write Marcelo Garcia was the greatest. Um, oh gosh, I forget who the. Uh, I think Matt Matt Joya, our our intern, 
which is a bit of a joke, um, <laughs> but uh, did a uh, an article on Andres Bernovskis, uh, his Omoplata game, I believe, was a specialist. And then uh, the weird guy fell to me. And so the natural choice was uh, Eduardo Tellis because he's really singular in the history of jiu-jitsu as a guy who's had, um, you know, it just never quite could get to the top of the mountain, but just a super competitive guy for like 20 years, you know, has a lot of big names on his resume, um, utilizing this extremely strange style. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. You made reference to it and I'll uh, expand on it a little. What, what Dan was talking about when he said that Telus was forced to develop this style was that Telus came up with, um, uh, the original Alliance team, and then the split offs, uh, TT in 99. And um, that those teams were like legendary. I mean, those mats contained guys who would go on to win two, three, four, five titles in, in Jiu Jitsu, just trained together every day under four time world champion Fabio Grigel. So it's just, it's just unbelievably difficult room. And uh, tell us it started a little later in life, and he wasn't, he didn't at least think that he was quite as naturally talented as a lot of these other guys. Um, and so he developed this turtle game because he could never stop specifically Terra Ray from passing his guard. Now, nobody could stop Terra Ray from passing their guard. So it wasn't that big of a deal, but you know, it, it bothered him. So he's like, well, I'm not going to be able to stop him. I got to find some way to deal with this. So he goes off in this direction where he starts developing the turtle into uh, a counter punching position, like this, this, this position where he can just counter almost anything you do to him. Now, going back to kind of what I said at the beginning about gimmicky stuff, there's a little bit of the gimmicky element to it. And if you watch some of his matches with, like, the real top guys, like, he's he's competed against Solo Hibero a bunch of times. He's never beaten him. And what always happens is Solo ends up getting him down somehow or Telus pulls guard, Telus goes to the turtle, and Solo always takes his back and ends up beating him. And because he's just – he's too good, right? Yeah. Like, the counters the counters don't work because they're they're not – the most possible fundamentally sound thing. Now you could argue he probably would have lost a solo anyway, <laughs> just by some other way. <laughs> right, right. Um, that's probably true. Totally. But um, you know, I, I do think there's there's some element of of gimmick in it. But he has developed this system to such a high level, and he's figured out the best way to do everything. That if you do make even a small mistake against him, like it's not gimmicky anymore, right? Like if he gets you in one of his positions, you're screwed. Um, and you see this in, in his matches. I think if uh, if folks want to go watch a match, um, he had a match against Otavio Souza uh, from like 2009, I think. And if you don't know, Otavio Souza is a three-time middleweight world champion, exceptionally good grappler. And Tellis beats him, and he sweeps him like the same way from Turtle three or four times. Um, it's a great match, actually, overall. It's very back and forth. Um, but, uh, you know, tell us, he, he did, he, he took this underutilized position and he figured out the best way to do everything from it. Um, he, probably his mistake, if, if I think he had one, was that he, would, he goes to it too readily um, against guys who are maybe too good to do that against. Um, but, you know, you do see him win matches like that. You know, he beat Souza, he beat Tarsus Humphreys, another world champion. Um, and he certainly ran through tons of guys that, uh, you know, good but not... Guys like me, good but not you know high level guys, right? Uh, right. Grappler's Quest and uh, uh, Nagas and things like that. So um, it's hard to fault him too much. He's made a career out of. It. Yeah, man, it's 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 an important position too because just principally, you know, and this is a you know this might sound a little bit you know too broad and historical woo woo, but you know kind of like you know again, I, I catch wrestling coaches tell me like when 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 grappling, you know, like oh wrestling was one of the first sports and. You see these, you know, these old Greek pictures of the they're wrestling on stone. Like, okay, if, if the, you know people were wrestling back in the day, were they were they pulling guard? It, 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 probably not. It probably hurt a lot to pull guard and work a guard when you were when there was no grappling mats back in the day. So what did you do? You went turtle. You went turtle. Yeah. You re wrestled. You got back into the fight. And so I always like the principle as far as that, as far as even because it translates to MMA. I feel like as far as re wrestling, getting back in the fight, not being too quick to, you know, um, retain guard and, and these things, which nothing against it, but it's one of those things where it's like, okay, what direction are they working in when a guy retains and closes his guard? We we almost criticize that now in certain, certain situations in modern day MMA at least, right? So the turtle, it, it, you know, as, as far as not being able to pass your guard, it really is true. Even guys who don't live and die by it but will use it in that sense is Nick Diaz, the Diaz brothers. Mm -hmm. Anytime George St. Pierre passed, which George St. Pierre is one of the best guard passers 
what did you know again Diaz still lost like Tellez lost because he couldn't he couldn't gain traction from said position but he disrupted the guard pass he rolls to turtle looks for a two on one tripods up and stands um, so it, it's really effective even someone low level unassuming and even as my older out of shape clearly uh, self now one of the things still that whether it's black belts or a pro fighter I can still get them to go what was that. It's usually something from the turtle because we don't see it that much still um, for whatever reason. Um, it's not used. A lot of the stuff there is very low energy and effective. So as I get older and out of shape, it actually doesn't hurt me. Certain positions, in fact, are very helpful. Um, having a little bit of mass and especially if you know how to use it and kind of properly tripod yourself to dissuade the, uh, the back takes and kind of hedge your bets there. But like you said, when Telez lost, just like... When I get beat, which is nine times out of ten, anyways, folks, don't get me wrong, don't get it wrong, but when I get beat playing turtle, it, it always feels like something really obvious because I always get my back taken and then I get choked out, right? And it's just like, oh yeah, that's 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 the obvious risk you always will inherently run with that position. So it'll make you, it'll make you kind of good from there. I'm gonna do a little bit of a, you know, uh, just gonna throw a, a turtle image here on the uh, on the screen for the viewers. Oh, not that one. But um, Brian Buckwild here is uh, riding me here from the turtle position. But basically, you know, you know, Tommy, a, 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 a lot of times, a lot of people have a different opinion on playing the turtle. But the picture I'm showing right now is I, I basically like to keep my hands in here to protect mm -hmm. from hooks. And I elect to use my forehead as the touching point to the mat, keeping really tight, keeping that almost ski, ski slope of a base. And generally, what, what I find, I'm going to, I can't stand looking at myself, so I'm going to strike that photo. I just wanted to give the audience some reference there. Obviously, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and what I find is that when you aren't facing those people that are ab above level, that, that can really specialize on breaking, breaking down that position, I feel like people get really excited. They feel like it's that false sense of security. They feel like a kid yeah. in the candy store. What do I want? Do I want the back take? Do I just want to do a ride? Do I want to maybe set up some kind of arm and guillotine, some kind of front choke? What do I want? And in that, in that minutia is when you can kind of capitalize on people sleeping. Or even if you let them work a little bit, sometimes they will expose themselves trying to break you down. They will almost open themselves up trying to open you up. There and therein lies the opportunities to re wrestle, sweep, Gramby roll, um, different options. Am, am I am I am I am I wrong there as far as that kind of basic breakdown no, of the position? No, you're not. And you know, don't any any criticism I make at Telus the style is is honestly not about what he does when he gets to the turtle. It's about the fact that he goes there so willingly. Hmm. Categorically, being in turtle is better than having your guard pass and being on bottom. Right. So, you know, it, and it is, it can be a very powerful intermediate position. If you look at what the, in many cases, the, the hardest part of grappling on the ground and um, something that takes people many years to get good at, it's actually consolidating your gains, right? So like I can pass, maybe I can get past your guard in the sense that I get past your legs, not for three points, but I, I get past your legs. And well, am I going to let you get to turtle? Like, am I going to prevent you from wrestling back towards me? Um, you know, can I prevent you from reestablishing your guard? Like, that is actually much harder. Um, you know, as, as a black belt, as an older black belt, there are plenty of competitive purple belts who can get close to passing my guard, but they can't finish and they can't consolidate. Mm -hmm. Because that's just a, it's just a very hard thing to do against a good, a good grappler. Um, who understands the resources that are there. And yeah. uh, certainly Turtle's a really important one of those. Because when you think about where you're at in Turtle, you've got a lot of possibilities for movement, right? Like you can you can roll over either shoulder. Um, if you can manage to hook a leg, you're in a good position to start uh, turning the corner and coming out on a single leg on the guy. Yep. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, of opportunity um, to, to, to get back into the, into the game from there. And uh, to your point, I think people do rush a lot from there. Um, if a guy turtles up like a good guy, I am going to go very, very slowly. Uh, yep. Because you have to make sure that you're shutting down their possibilities um, for recountering. Yep. So, you know, I'm going to get my shin over one of your ankles. Yes. Before, yep. I start, before I start committing my weight in my hands. I'm not going to lean over your body, right? Um, I actually tend to treat turtle, <clears throat> I go less for direct back takes. I think this is a place where um, 
you should put on your wrestling hat and you should focus more on breaking guys down. Yes. Um, yes. Because that's often much more effective against a guy who's really good at turtle. Yeah. You, they, they know. They know the back take. Yeah. And they can defend that. But it can often be harder to defend the slow breakdown. Um, you know, if you can get a wrist ride and crank them over that wrist and force one of their shoulders to the mat such that they can't grand beat, um, that's the beginning of the end. For them. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's another reason why I'll go, you know, head post and I'll delegate my arms to go in and block hooks to try because I know at least most guys I train with they know heavy on the hands. You, you, you know, they're gonna try to shuck me, bump me, try to get me to post out, try to get me to yeah to to, to witten up. And I, I totally agree with you, by the way, not just from Telus, but in general. Even when I preach turtle. I never preach anybody to become a turtle player, and I never yeah. preach anybody to hang out there or go there so willingly because I, I agree with you there, Tommy. So instead, I will cite examples like the Nick Diaz example, a, a last a last ditch effort to not get past, look for your two on one, stand up if that's your yeah. fight to get back to your feet, or uh, like some quick things like I'll bait. I won't hang out there too long, or if I do, sometimes um, in a quick scramble, and maybe I can't swim in for the single single, and the guy's already got a side ride position. In yeah. that case, I will purposely let my far side hand go here to encourage them to do that slump over side ride, you know, where they're either going to look to punch if it's MMA or they're going to yeah. look to secure their position if it's grappling, especially in a scramble. You want to hurry up and grab. I know they're going to grab there. I want to bait that grab because as soon as they reach in, now I can get behind their elbow and it's Peterson roll city. Now I can Peterson roll, turn mm -hmm. in, I'm on top, etc. There's little, little traps and, and, and little games that I like from there. But I'm not as comfortable, and nor do I preach anybody to be as comfortable as a guy like Tellus, who constantly goes there. And I guess jumping off that point, back into your article, I love how you connected that the half guard was so connected to there because mm -hmm. I never yeah. realized that. I'm like, well, that's my second most strongest position, and it's not a coincidence, and I learned that from reading your article. Yeah, it's, it's not something that well, – it's a very strange kind of half guard. Like getting to that weird Tela style half guard from the turtle is is not like a normal half no, guard. So no. it's not odd that there's not a connection there. But if you watch enough of his matches, you realize that a lot of times what he's doing in turtle is he's setting up half guard sweeps um, as uh, as uh, the person's trying to work and, and take his back. So uh, yeah, he connects up in a very novel way. And honestly, I had not noticed that until I started breaking down his matches for that article. That was a, a real light bulb for me watching that. Um, and that's going back to that uh, Otavio Souza match that I referenced. Uh, that's how he sweeps it over and over yeah. and over. And it's it's really fantastic. I, I would highly advise uh, anybody to go uh, go watch that. I it's mean, a weird style. I, I definitely got the old man game, man. So my, it was funny when you made that connection for me. I'm like, oh, sweet. Now I can connect my two old men that I structure my game off of, which is Eduardo Tellis's turtle and Damian Maya's single leg half guard getup. Like that's essentially my whole game there. That's all I do, yeah. and and it is, it's to get to get to a top position and, and make life miserable. And that's it. That's all I do. <laughs> but well, for MMA, I think the Maya approach is a lot better than Tellis's. Yes, um, yes. I, I would not. Uh, I would not play like Tellis does for for MMA. Um, you know, the biggest problem with Tellis is he's he's trapped, and and this is. I, tr maybe not the, the best phrasing, but he's trapped in the, the jujitsu meta game, which is that I'm going to stay on the ground. Yes. Right? I'm on the bottom. Like I'm going to play for the bottom and yes. try to sweep you. Like that's really not what you should, should be your first line of defense for turtle. Like your first line of defense should be, I should get back to my feet. And, and, and I, um, sorry, sorry. I don't want to interrupt. I, I agree. No, I, I agree with this point, but just to, just to close the, just to not to close the book, but get to that point of, of this segment of the conversation. I, I agree with that as far as it doesn't his his game doesn't work for MMA with the meta, but yeah. I, I still would argue that I wish people weren't treating it as such a black and white issue. Like even in without MMA context, you'll hear jujitsu guys scold you in class. No, you're gonna give your back that way, and they're gonna force you to work work out of the position the way they want you to work out of it. Um, and I feel like we're a little still a little bit too tethered to that. Uh, I still feel like there's a lot of benefits. And back to what you just said as far as using it to get up, another get up example, Jorge Rivera uh, is another old school name. And he yeah. actually used the turtle a lot. This was a Muay Thai guy, a, a middleweight, a Muay Thai striking middleweight, folks. This was not a jiu-jitsu guy, but I can't remember what fight it was. I don't think it was the Bisping fight. It was one perhaps before. But he kept getting rocked as Jorge Rivera did toward the end of his career and dropped. Yeah. But what would he do? He would he would go turtle, right? And the ref would start warning, I'm going to stop it. And the guy swarms with punches. But he would use it to re re recompose, recover. As soon as the guy would get to his side rider, ground and pound position, he felt him out, would swim, swim for mm -hmm. his underhook, 
and stand safely using the other far side hand to hand fight head position and then push out from the clinch and reset. And it's just even for stuff like that, I feel like preaching the turtle option is just is still underutilized, I guess, is my my, my, yeah. my thesis, my opinion here. Well, so I think when you when you look at turtle, you have to include referees position when you're talking for MMA, yes. you have to include refer referees position, right? From American folk style wrestling. Yeah. Because that's really where you see it the most. Guys just don't hang out there. They get to their knees and then they go two on one on a wrist. They attack the wrist. They use that to stand back up, often against the cage, and that's that's how they get back to their feet. Right. Um, you know, I think one of the things I love about about MMA is that uh, and grappling in MMA, even though I'm a jujitsu guy mostly, um, I, I think that wrestling is the core of grappling because there are really three questions you have to ask yourself when you're grappling with anybody, which is, can I take this guy down? Uh, can I keep him down and can I submit it? Right. And jujitsu addresses one of those really well. Yes. Can I submit them? Yeah. It, it addresses, can I keep him down fairly well? But the problem is that most jujitsu guys don't actively try to get back to their feet. Right. And it does a terrible job of addressing the, can I take the guy down part? Yes. Um, so, you know, I, I think that MMA is really the only place where you see all those addressed pretty much equally, right? Like there's all, there's a fight to take the guy down and the yep. other guy, you know, knows how to try and stop you there's a fight to keep the guy down never easy no mma mma guys never accept being on down anymore nor should they it'd be a terrible idea um and then they all have almost everybody um has at least some submission i guess melvin guillard's still fighting so not everybody but <laughs> almost everybody has some submission defense uh yeah chael son is retired too so even though Chael's actually a pretty good grappler now but uh, um you know it's uh it's really the only place where you see all of those addressed equally and you see the interplay between them um, in what I think is, is kind of the purest expression of grappling. Uh, plus, of course, you can punch the guy, which is really, really important uh, and, and game changing as well. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, um, I, I really do think that when you're looking at the turtle, you look at it as a position where, yeah, you, you need to be good at getting back to your feet and you need to be good at using it to stay safe and create scrambles, protect your back, keep yourself off your back uh, in terms of having your back on the mat. Um, and if you can do all that, it, it can be an extremely effective position for you. Yeah, totally. I mean, I was just, you know, just people understand, we're talking about, of course, people understanding as far as the application, the athletes, the martial artists themselves. Um, I'd, I'd also add on to that that we still have a lot to go from crowd to even refereeing official uh, to understanding the position, you know. I just said it on my last podcast. What was the thing they used to say about Chuck Liddell? Um, oh, Chuck Liddell will just get punched in the face to get back to his feet. He doesn't care. Like, well, no, Chuck Liddell used to be a wrestler, folks. Um, and he was essentially doing the get-ups that we see a lot of people, yeah. like to your point, doing now. It's just he was doing it in the earlier days. That being said, even though we understand it a lot more, you know, we still don't see the understanding for it a lot. Now, I, I think it was a fine stoppage on Cejudo versus Cruz. Cejudo is probably going to wash Cruz anyways. The problem I had with, when listening to people argue about that stoppage is that, and stoppages like that, is that nobody accounts for what the turtle, what what was the reason why they were going to turtle in the first place? It's it's not always a submissive, um, a, a retreat, uh, give up position. Sometimes it's conversely used to get back up. And that's just a yeah. little pet peeve of mine. I'm not going to get too far down, but hopefully the understanding of that position grows. Yeah, it, it would be good. And, um, you know, MMA does have one thing that really favors the turtle, which is you can't punch guys in the back of the head. Yeah. Um, you know, if you get good at at, hide, at ducking that shoulder oh, on yeah. the side that the guy's riding you on, and um, if you can control their, their, their arm that's over your back or that's around you and duck so that they can only see the back of your head, you can actually stay very safe there. Uh, yep. um, you know, you have to watch them like switching over to hammer fisting you on the other side, but that is obviously not nearly as damaging a strike as a, you know, a, just a straight punch from, from the top. Yeah. Um, and, and you'd certainly have the opportunity there too, I think, to, to roll for knee bars and create scrambles. You know, not everything has to be like a clean attempt for a finish. Uh, the right. way you see a lot of guys play legs in MMA, and I think it's the right way to do it, is uh, you attack something just to keep the other guy moving. Yeah. Just to create opportunities oh, to yeah. get back up, um, and you know that's that's a super valuable use for that. Even if you never finish a leg. Totally. I mean, when I, you know, I, you know, back to your point about hiding heads. That's why I always preach single legs are the best, and that's why whether I'm turtle or half guard, I'm all swimming for that single. 
and uh, yeah. you know to hide the head and and, and, and you know and and, and t- you know to to t- to your point there. Uh, about playing legs, the same thing. If, if a guy's beating me, he's not letting me in, well, that means he's probably got his shoulder, right, driven into my face um, from top side half uh, and making me play that way. Then I'll probably look to maybe C-clamp under his armpit and then go roll for a heel hook. But I'm not trying to go for the heel hook, like your point, Tommy. I'm just trying to create space and get a scramble going yeah. to get up underneath this guy. Yeah. Um, great thing on there. Two, two last quick ones. These ones will be quicker because I'm less passionate about them. But I do want your thoughts on them. More importantly here, Tommy. Yeah, sure about guard systems um one we'll go with which is a shoulder pin or williams guard you know what this is i'm putting a picture mm-hmm. uh now that's uh, my coach uh, neil melanson who taught me it out of the shoulder pin he's using a uh, three finger grip I- i've heard it referred to as a label label grip but i've also seen i also thought label grip was something different by the way but he's using a three finger grip for people getting confused we'll just call it that um and basically the shoulder pin williams guard uh the way I was taught to it, I like it because we see, and this isn't just shit on rubber guard here, but one of the things we always see commentators get excited about that almost always leads to nothing in MMA is a guy's rubber high guard. If anything, at best, we've seen it kind of just stall for punches. Obviously, there's so much more to that system, um, whether you're talking about you know no gi and, and competitions, and I'm not trying to discredit that. I'm, we're talking about MMA here, folks. That's the reason why I like the shoulder pin I think it's more effective for setting up submissions, but more importantly, it doesn't require crazy knee flexibility to go to. As you guys saw in the picture I just put on the screen, you're kind of weaving under your own leg and you're leaning off to a hip um, and securing either a palm to palm or I actually like the three finger grip because it really allows you leverage to drive your forearm into their chest. So you're getting the high guard effect, right? Like a rubber guard. Uh, but you're also getting that counter pressure, which is a really strong fulcrum when you got this three finger grip of driving into their chest, making your opponent on top uncomfortable. Um, what's your experience or opinions with these guards? We obviously don't see them that much in general, uh, especially in MMA. I feel like it's a, a safe, uh, more applicable, and requires less flexibility. So for me, on, on those stances, I guess I, I, I'm surprised we don't see them more. So. I think you have to look at how the use of the guard has evolved in MMA. So early MMA, it was primarily offensive, right? right? Like, so guys, you know, going all the way back, like Hoist would pull guard so he could armbar guys. That nah, worked because nobody knew anything. But for a long time, and I think largely just the influence of, um, of the Gracies on the, on the origins of the, uh, the, the modern origins of the sport, um, you saw guys treating the guard as more of an offensive position. Um, where we've evolved to is that guard is about staying safe and getting back to your feet. And most guys are good enough grapplers on top that they know how to stay safe if they're if they're in your guard. And they can they can do damage and they can win rounds, right? They might not finish you, but they'll they'll win the round. And uh, so I think you see this real shift from guards where so so the slight digression. The main focus, the main function for guard and MMA is to control distance and not get hit. Right. So you either do that by being so close and trapping the guy that they can't hit you, or you do it by being far enough away that they can't really hit you. Yes. Um, and if you're in the middle, you're you're going to get punched. So yes. you can be you can either have something like a knee shield half guard where you can control the distance such that it's really hard for the guy to land a, a solid punch on you, and you can start framing away and getting back to your feet, or you can have something like uh, like variations of close guard where you're trying to wrap the guy up so tightly that uh, that he can't punch you and you can slowly set up a submission and i think most guys tend towards the distance guards because they want to get back to their feet because that's where they want to be working Mm -hmm. as mma has become more and more of a sport for strikers and that favors strikers in the scoring um the as as such the premium has also risen on uh, being able to get back to your feet and so that's what most guys are trying to do um, so these things like the rubber guard and the Williams guard, those are trapping guards where you're trying to keep the guy really close. You're trying to eliminate his ability to punch you, uh, via, via keeping him close by tying up his limbs. And so I think you just don't see him cause that's not what guys are fundamentally trying to do with their guards when they get taken down. Now, in terms of the rubber guard versus the Williams guard, my biggest beef with the rubber guard is not actually that it requires flexibility. I think most professional athletes should be flexible enough to, to play rubber guard if they want to. It's that, and I, I have the same problem with the lockdown half, uh, by the way. Um, this must be a 10th planet thing. <laughs> when, you, when you play 
rubber guard, you are essentially shutting down a, a large percentage of your own hit mobility. And what that means is that it is very, very difficult to move around the guy, move your own body to set up attacks. Um, so if you have a guy on top who's knowledgeable and who knows how to like just stay really tight, because you are shutting Apologies for that quick edit and stumble, but Tommy, picking up where you were, you were off on the Roganism as far as the guard talk yes. and rubber guard talk, please. Yeah, so you, how you actually see rubber guard get used in MMA is a guy will go to it for a second, Joe Rogan will lose his mind, like, oh, he's got the rubber guard, right. and then the guy lets it go. Well, why did he go for it? Was it to set up a you know an omoplata or a, you know gogo plata? No, it was because he felt the guy on top was starting to create some space to uh, to punch him, and so he went to the rubber guard temporarily to totally shut the guy down and prevent him from doing that. Because the rubber guard is good for that. It makes it very hard for the the guy to punch him. Certainly on one side, it makes it impossible, and it makes it hard for him to get any leverage on on the other side. Um, but you know. It, it does really limit your hit mobility, which means you can't move around the guy. It's harder to create chances. You're relying on a lot of kind of tricky things to, to create chances for submissions that knowledgeable grapplers can often shut down. Um, there's a reason you don't see anybody get submitted from rubber guard in Abu Dhabi, um, even though there are consistently 10th Planet guys there. And good grapplers. 10th Planet has some very good grapplers. Right. But the rubber guard is not what works well for them. Um, so, you know, I think that's why you don't see it so much in MMA. Now the Williams guard, I think that's probably just more a function of it being kind of a specialized grappling thing. I mean, it's not even all that popular, even within grappling. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, it doesn't Um, seem like it. So I, I, I think there's probably more applicability for the shoulder pin, um, in MMA because you can force your setups a little bit more. Um, it's harder for the guy to, uh, to stop you from, from moving your hips and getting out to one side or the other to set things up. Um, you know, one guard that I think that works quite well that, that you see that's re- closely related to uh, the Williams guard is you'll see a lot of guys play overhook. Yes, overhook. I was going to say that. Perfect. Right? Yes, absolutely. And, and yeah. the reason that that's really good is because you're shutting down everything on one side and then you're facing the, uh, the free arm that can punch you yep. so you can post on the shoulder and stop the guy. Absolutely. And if he goes on and punches you because he's wearing gloves, gloves make a huge difference in grappling. If you've never grappled with gloves, I highly encourage you to do it to yes. see how different it is. Yes. Um, you can hook over that glove, very solid grip, um, loop that elbow over your shin and really just stop the guy from doing anything. And that's actually a very hard position for guys to break out of. And you can set up triangles and elbow plotters very effectively from there. So, you know, I, I do think that um, those kind of trapping guards make a lot of sense. And uh, guys who like to grapple, uh, you do see that more. Actually, even though he hasn't been on his back much recently, Habib Nurmagomedov has an oh, yes. trapping. Yeah, he does. And you can yeah. see it. Probably the best fight for that is may- maybe Trujillo? I want to say maybe the Abel Trujillo. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, he almost triangles Trujillo a couple of times because uh, he's just really good at tying him up and, and locking him down. And that's I think that's a if you're going to play close guard, that's the that's one of the best ways to do. It. Yeah, absolutely. The you 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 beat me to it. The overhook ties nicely, and in fact, coaches like like Neil uh, Melanson will tell you use the overhook to kind of get your hips in a position because it's a much more flexible, applicable, easier thing to get to, then go to the shoulder pin if that's your if that's your thing. But even yeah. even even shoulder pin guys will recommend the overhook. And for MMA, you can strike from both, but from the overhook position, I mean, look at Neil Siri, shout out to, you know, Irish flyweight, <laughs> um showing some showing, showing some applicable uh, combat jiu-jitsu. He uses that overhook guard and he would just ram guys inside of their heads with elbows like it would it, Tony yeah. Ferguson would have been uh, would, would be impressed you know, with what Neil Siri was doing, put it that way. So the overhook guard is really good. Um, it's right there. Uh, and I also like how you talked about the ways of playing in a guard. And this is kind of a concept that was, I'll probably brutalize it here, Tommy, so you can correct me or, or weigh in. But just one of the things that the, uh, I guess the pride of a Williams or a shoulder guard position is traditionally now, again, context, there's, there's always, right, there's always exceptions to the rule here. I'm not speaking hard and fast. But there's three ways to play inside the guard all the way in, uh, safely postured, right? Uh, posturing out, playing in as far as trying to thwart uh, thwart someone's guard when you're playing from top side. And the third, which you would see more for like a rubber guard or a high guard, is um, backing out, right? And that kind of, eh, that's a weird kind of nether, nether region that, that, that loops in a bit with the posturing because that's essentially what you're backing out to, a safe and postured uh, position. 
But what I like about the shoulder pin, or people will teach it, will, will tell you, I guess, is that you get a little bit of a feel and control on all three of those areas, and mm-hmm. you can kind of keep somebody playing in tension in that mid area, right? They always say if you're in the guard, you want to be here, here. When you're starting, when you're in the 90 degree, now you're playing a bit. Now you're you're playing with fire, depending on, you know. Of course, if it's MMA context and there's punches, it's a little bit different. You can maybe work toward yeah. a GSP head-to-head. But in general, you're kind of playing with fire. So I guess for those principles, I've always kind of uh, liked playing with the um, with the shoulder pin. But you're right, it's hip mobility. And that's kind of the trapping with the rubber guard because whether you're playing the dead orchard or all these different, you know, crackhead controls, your hips are kind of here and trapped, right? Yeah. Whereas shoulder pin, depending on what side you attack, you can get off to either side. And it doesn't matter what side you're on, there's different attacks for each hip. So if I'm locking you up with the shoulder pin on this side and I'm on that same side hip, the arm bar is probably going to be the most active thing for me. And I'm probably means I'm on that hip because you just took me down and the momentum's headed that way. You saw Khabib do that with his overhook guard. That's what I loved about that in the Trujillo fight. It's not just he goes for the overhook guard, but he knows which way the momentum's going and he takes him over to that side. And, and, and yeah. so he doesn't even have to hang out in his guard, which is the whole kind of, you know, the, the today's today's game. So I, I'm, I know I'm ranting here, but uh, I guess that, you know, I, I guess that I, I, I just was surprised not to see it more in MMA. But to your point, Tommy, we really don't see it catching on and grappling. I'm not saying it's the savior move or anything. It's just one of those things that always kind of scratched my head. Yeah, you know, I, I think when you when you look at, at straight grappling competition, it's just a lot easier to create chances from a more traditional close guard. Um, and especially you see guys getting better and better and better at using close guard. No, Nogi as well to, yeah. to go to the back. And um, I, I'm biased because this is a specialty of my, my coach. Um, but I, I think that's an incredibly successful way to play. And if you want to see a great example of it, look at um, Shanji Hibero against Rustam Chaseyev from the last Abu Dhabi. Um, extremely powerful wrestler in uh, Chaseyev. And uh, Shanji just gets right on his back from close guard and ends up arm barring him. And it's Wonderful. Uh, really, really pretty. And Hunter Gracie used to do it all the time to everybody. So. Absolutely. I think that's that's a great way to play close guard for uh, for pure grappling. And but because that's grappling doesn't work as well in MMA. Guys maybe just don't get as good at the at the shoulder pan. They don't teach it. There are a lot of reasons that techniques don't catch fire, even if they do make some uh, make some sense logically. Absolutely. And perhaps this this last and final one before we get out of here, Tommy, will fit that category. In fact, I think it does even more so. It's much more obscure. It's much more hipster, admittedly. Um, perhaps this was a kind of a remnant of that fancy 2010 era jujitsu kind of fading out. And I thought maybe we could see more of it, especially because at that point we already started moving away from close guard. It was already starting to move toward, you know, 2012 area. We're already starting, you know, moved more toward open guard stuff and getting back to a feed of emphasis. Um, but, but K control, uh, K guard, and I'm going to put, we already went over this. I'm going to put a picture for our audience here. Um, that's uh, me and Corey Conway. Uh, Corey fought pro and uh, fought, uh, I think he got amateur titles and tough enough. But uh, I, I put the, it, it, the picture, honestly, I hate pictures of myself, but it's, it's, it, it is actually a good one of the few good pictures I could find of K-Control. And essentially, it's the same picture I showed you, Tommy, where uh, you're, you're essentially, I'll opt for this from full guard even. I'll, I'll usually go to half guard first because, again, I'm more of a simple guy. I'm just going to swim up for the Damian Maya single. But I'll still go for this when I'm feeling fancy. I'm also, yeah. and now that I'm rolling in a gi, I actually find it much more applicable there, to be honest, that I can grab a sleeve. But in the picture on the screen, I'm grabbing a wrist because it's no gi. I'm debasing or attempting to debase the weight with a leg hook, a leg underhook, if you will, on the same side. My right foot is going up into the armpit. So now I've got some control. I've got some driving and pushing pressure. Uh, I, I guess any guard, right? That's a principle you want. You want to off balance or make uncomfortable your opponent. And I'm making a mistake here, folks. My left knee and shin isn't driving into the chest as much as it should be to complete the dynamic different points of pressure there. Um, but uh, basically from here, you can go omoplatas, sweeps. Uh, if they go to punch you, you can catch an armbar or catch a triangle choke if they go to punch into it uh, to reset their balance because they are forced to counterbalance themselves. Um, I like it. You can even you know roll for a knee bar from here or not even roll for a knee bar, kind of back roll to like a, a Tellez, like turtle sweep, mm-hmm. end up end up kind of perpendicular next to them and look to bump from there. Um, a lot of things, obviously it's more of a fancy, more of a woo-woo technique, definitely fits more under there. 
But uh, I haven't really seen too many people try to use it in MMA, Tommy. I only can think of maybe Carlos Condit as far as high-level names. Is this something mm -hmm. you see a lot in grappling or MMA? What are your thoughts on it? So I, I think it's probably better for MMA than, than grappling. Um, but it's not something you see a lot of um, for a couple of reasons. So one, uh, it's a very specialized position, as you said. Sure. It's not something that most people know how to teach um, or, or just know themselves. In fact, the only people I've ever seen show this are uh, Neil Melanson, and then, uh, do you know who Lu Luis Claudio is by any chance? Yeah, Luis Claudio. So Luis Claudio, Hicks and Gracie black belt. Very odd that this is also a Hickson thing. Uh, teaches a position very, very similar to this, where he will uh, play with a knee shield from closed guard, turning sideways, and go two on one on um, the the hand on the side he's turning to. Yeah. And uh, looks a lot like this. And in fact, um, I think maybe Crone has played that in one or two fights. Um, because it's, it's a Hickson thing. So very odd that you would get these two very uh, polar opposite kind of uh, kind of lineages coming um, to the uh, same conclusion. Um, but, you know, it's just it's, it's kind of a it's an unusual thing. Most people don't know it. I think it works better in MMA, um, probably because it's really oriented around controlling the guy's upper body so he can't get leverage to punch you. Um, and it's uh, it's probably not something where you're going to get a ton of chances in, in pure grappling to, to set a lot of stuff up. Cause I feel like if a guy's not trying to move and punch you, he can kind of sit on your arm and make it hard to hard for you to force something. Yes. Um, now you do see guys use, uh, use the motion. You mentioned the knee bar, uh, Dylan Dan has won what I think is still his lone Bellator fight by knee bar, a guy from close guard, yeah. in almost exactly this manner, right? Under hooking, opening his legs, turning into the knee shield and then inverting to, to pull up the knee. Um, so I'm not saying there's no chances, but, um, you know, it's just, anytime you look at a technique and you, you wonder why you don't see it more, you have to ask yourself, like, what is the investment for a professional fighter in how long it takes them to learn this versus how much mileage they're going to get out of it? Um, and in something like this, like, yeah, it might work if you're really good at it, but right. do they really have a lot of incentive to learn it? It's not something they've been working on since they were, you know, first coming up the amateurs, just going to jujitsu classes in, in learning in the gi. Might take a lot of work to learn for a, a situation that they hope to not be in very much, like bottom close guard. So absolutely, yeah. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, effort to is, is the juice worth the squeeze kind of question you have to ask. So I, I think that's why you don't see it used. But you know, fundamentally, I, I do think it makes a lot of sense because you're doing one of the fundamental things you have to be able to do for um, with a closed guard in MMA, which is, are you controlling uh, punches from both sides? And you are here, right? Because you're controlling the arm on one side, and then your knee shield is preventing them from punching you with any, any power on, uh, on the other side. So I do think it passes kind of the basic test of, of safety. Now, underhooking a guy's leg when you're wearing a glove, I think is yes. a little risky yes. because he can sit on your leg, on your arm, it could be almost impossible for you to get it out. And if you lose control of that wrist, he can punch you. Yep. And you can't block with the arm on that side. So, you know, a little double edge. That might be why um, Louise, as I mentioned, teaches it with the, the two on one on that yeah, side. Yeah, no, that uh, I like that variation. I've seen that, yes. You know, yeah, which by the way, Louise uh, taught, is a Ben Rothwell's teacher, Jiu Jitsu teacher, and I think was Juliana Pena's teacher for a long time. That's I'm right. Not certain. Yep. I, I think no, so. You're, you're so, right. So, you know, he's. He knows he he knows something about MMA grappling. He's he's not just some guy making up shit in the basement. Um, so you know I, I do think there is something there, but uh, it, between not a lot of people knowing how to play it and then just the level of effort it takes uh, an MMA fighter to learn it versus how often they'd use it, I just don't think it's something you'll ever see a whole lot of. Well, going back to your point, and again, it wasn't. I, I don't think it's a criticism. Whatever it was, it was fair. And I I, I come from the uh, lineage of the guy, so I can sign off. But what you said about Neil earlier was that. A lot of his techniques, he's a he's a big guy, and to his credit, though, here, here's here's to his credit, and he does he does try to teach people to fight to their body type, mm -hmm. uh, but not only is a big guy, which makes things difficult to replicate, but he's actually very he's got excellent leg dex, he's got long arms and legs, mm -hmm. but he's very uh, excellent dexterity. He's great off his back, can invert like a small guy, and yeah. uh, kind of like what from from Tyson to. Uh, you know, uh, other sports, the best heavier weights were guys who operated and thought like smaller guys. That's probably not a coincidence there. Um, so to your point that you made earlier, that's another reason why he's one of the only guys teaching this and we don't see it is because it, it takes a ton of dexterity and a lot of skills. Yeah. And I mean, 
I pull my hair out for the last 10 years yelling risk control at the TV and only like in the last three years people are finally starting to understand how <laughs> freaking important that it, risk yeah. control is the gatekeeper to freaking grappling. Sorry, I get really passionate about that. Um, and Neil's one of those guys that drilled that crazily into our head. So like there's all these things that like have to already be instilled to your point before you can even think about saying, okay, is this even worth it to add to my game from there? So it makes yeah. perfect sense why uh, I'm less confused, I guess, Tommy, to say that I'm le I, I get why we don't see this one as much uh, around around anymore. Yeah, you know, it is one of those where it, you might see a specialist someday who, uh, at least on the regional scenes or at, at lower levels, like just submits everybody from this position and, you know, everybody loses their minds about it for six months. That would uh, that wouldn't shock me because I do think there's some um, there's some concepts embedded in in this guard that uh, that make a lot of sense. Um, and I don't I don't think it's fundamentally wrong. I just think you're you know, some techniques you have a big margin for error in terms of playing them right or wrong. And some techniques work. But and, and maybe even work against anybody, but your margin for error is much smaller. Yes. So this might just be one of those techniques where if you're good enough at it, like, yeah, it'll it'll work against anybody. There's not anything fundamentally wrong with it. But but you got to do it right and you got to do it right the whole time. And if you screw up, it's real bad. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Um, you and, know, if and, you're going to be a well, like you, you look at another guy like this, like this kind of you go back to someone like Paul Harris. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like um, leg locks work. Heel hook and dudes works great. Um, but in the context of MMA, if you're going to be inverting under guys to heel hook them, you got, you have to be perfect at it. Yes. And if you're not, and then you find Alan Belcher and he's just like, no, nah, I'm, I'm just going to go into your game and beat the shit out of you. And he does it like, well, you, you inverted under the guy. It's kind of your own fault. You didn't finish your technique. So now you're, now you're dead. Well, no, that, that's true. That was a classic fight. Great, great God, one to cite like there. Fight. Great one to cite. I love how that does, too. How does Alan Belcher walk with balls so big? I don't I mean, know, man. Or, or that fight. Oh. Those those thick thighs alone, man. I mean, what did Paul Harris think he was getting? Him, what do you think? What do you think he was getting himself into? Where were those things going? Nowhere, nowhere. Let's go on a, on a huge tangent on how cool Alan Belcher is, but like that fight, the context of it was he had just gone through ADCC and beaten everybody up to Galvao and destroyed, like destroyed the legs of some good grapplers, destroyed scary. Dave Avalon. I think yes, basically that was scary. That Dave Avalon. It yeah. was terrifying, and it was like. It wasn't like it happened in some scramble. It was a restart, and Paul Harris oh. just destroyed it. Like it's hard to like watch. Chill. I have so, chills right now just you remembering yeah, me. Yeah, it's, remember. it's yeah, awful. It was gross. Um, and it was it was psychotic, right? Like he could have gotten. The he knew what was going to happen too with Paul Harris. Oh, yeah. he, already knew. he already had the reputation at this point. People. Yeah, and then he tried to give him a hug afterwards, which was very bizarre. Weird. Um, and in the UFC, he had just destroyed Mike Pierce's knee, and I think it functionally ended his career. I, I don't recall ever hearing anything about him again. Thomas Jarrell um, too, I think. Yeah, he, he had killed a couple guys. And before that fight, he gets Belcher. And Belcher, in interviews, is like, no, nah, I'm just going to wrap him. I don't give a shit about his leg locks. Like, a great leg lock defense. I'm going to beat his ass if he tries to leg lock me. And that's exactly what he did. And, oh, it's so great. God, I, I think we did a top five uh, fights on Big Fox. Uh, I think Zane Simon was the guest. And I'm pretty sure oh, yeah. that was both on our easily on our, our top yeah. five list for Big Fox fights, for sure. Um, oh, wow, this was a great conversation, Tommy. I'm definitely... Uh, I, I want you to touch on anything guard wise you want to get off your chest before we get out of here. But I dare say, I think we, we covered some really unique guards concepts from judo to the ground and, and maybe, um, yeah, shed some light, hopefully for the people watching as far as, uh, as far as ground fighting and perhaps questions they might've had. Well, you know, I'll, uh, I'll, because I, I imagine a lot of your audience are people who train. Um, I'll just throw something out there that I, I think is extremely important if you want to fight. And frankly, if you just want to be, a really good nogi player um don't think of the guard as a thing you do from your back the guard is wrestling just play the guard like wrestling try to sweep the guy try to come up on single legs try to come up on double legs just treat it as as aggressively attacking the guy do not get in the terrible jujitsu habit of just chilling out in guard like always be attacking from there and always be coming up and, and wrestling um, and if you're a jujitsu guy who wants to be a really good grappler get good at wrestling because wrestling is the core of, of grappling. I agree with that. I agree. That's one of the uh, things I'm really grateful about my sensibilities. I hate most of my sensibilities because they're contrarian and hipster, but I've always gravitated toward the wrestling with my grappling styles. And, and, and uh, it's really just done wonders even for a noob, uh, an unathletic guy like myself. So listen to Tommy folks. Um, Man, you can come up on a single from anywhere. Exactly, man. I'm always swimming for singles. That's my life. 
Uh, last, sorry, we had two questions. I would feel like a jerk if we didn't get to those. No, uh, sure. And I already feel like a jerk, folks, because I've kept Tommy. He is a saint, though, and you wouldn't be able to know it. This one I comes. Am. This one. This one comes from Round Zero MMA at Round Zero MMA. What are the keys to a successful Kani Basami in a no gi fight, as in the case of MMA? I am ignorant to this one. I'm gonna deflect, and hopefully Tommy knows what he's what what, what, what this gentleman's talking about. Yeah. Uh, don't try to do it from distance unless you're Kung Lee, and I'm guessing you're not, so don't. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, Kani Basami means crab scissors in Japanese. Oh, yeah, it I know is, this is now, yes, yes. It, is, uh, yes, it yes. is a flying leg lock entry, and the people who made it famous, so Kung Lee used to do this against totally overmatched yeah. hands in Sanshao. Yes. Um, all the time. He'd do it from, like, a long way away and throw himself into it. It was spectacular and would never work against anybody good. I don't yep. think I ever saw him try it in MMA. Um and then uh, probably the most famous example, it's not quite from a traditional Kani Basami, but it's very similar, is uh, Anderson Silva getting heel hooked by Rio Chonin. Yep. Um, I think that was in Pride. It might have been like Rumble on the Rock, but uh, I, th I think it was Pride. Um, so that's those are two th those are two things you can go look at. Honestly, if you go look at a Kung Lee Sanchao highlight, like it's well worth it. Just remember that none of the guys he's fighting are good. Doesn't... They're all they're all like teachers and you know like taxi drivers. Uh, who do Kung Fu on the weekends. Hey, so. but it was the coolest thing Which on MTV fine. back in the day, Tommy. You know what I'm talking oh about. It was the coolest thing oh on MTV <laughs> compared gosh. to what they were showing. Uh, so much fun. <laughs> this was pre, uh, this was pre MMA and tough era we're, we're referencing here, folks. So seeing Kung Lee hit that was kind of actually, was actually kind of cool without knowing the context, at least for me. I was like, oh, look at that. Oh, it's, it's still cool. Even if you know the context, it's cool. <laughs> like you, you know, you can still appreciate, appreciate it. Even if uh, you realize that it, wouldn't work on anybody really good. Um, but no, so so Kani Basami is this leg lock entry. Um, what I would say, there's there's really two, there's a few main points to doing it right. So the first one is you gotta have a really strong wizard, right? You gotta be really close to the guy um, because if you can create any space, you're just gonna fall off um, when you go to jump. The best time to do it is if the guy has picked up a single leg on you and you're and is kind of hopping to your side because yeah. you don't really wanna do the version where your, your top leg comes over both of his legs and your other leg goes behind both of his that's actually not as solid how you really want to do it is have your leg in between his so you can get your instep on the the back of his far side knee um and then the last thing i would say is don't hurry it actually is not that fast of a technique even though you're because you're not really jumping what you really want to do is get the guy to bend over a little post with your free hand and then lift up your your leg that's going to go behind his legs and make sure that you're jamming the top of your thigh around your knee, like into the back of his, to his like knee pit, right? Cause you actually want to like get him to pop up off his feet yeah. when you throw this. And once you hit it, and this is probably the most important thing. Once you hit it, immediately grab his far leg with both your hands. Because when you hit this move, you have ended up in a, uh, in a saddle position, in an inside Sankaku position. All the escapes that work for inside Sankaku involve the other guy being able to have his far leg free, mm -hmm. right? So the way you consolidate the position, do not go for the heel hook right away. Grab his far leg with both hands, pull it towards you, cinch everything tight, get that leg under your armpit. Ideally, if you can, and you can see Eddie Cummings do this in a ton of matches, yeah. pass that leg to your far armpit so his legs are crossed and one leg's under his armpit, you, you can heel hook him one-handed. Yeah. Right. You just and when you heel hook him, heel hook is not I'm getting into a lot of stuff here, but heel hook is not a turning motion. That is not how you make a heel hook work. You lock it up. You take out all the slack in the leg by pulling back. So now his leg is twisted at a weird angle and but all the slacks out and then you hip in. But slowly hurting. I'm hurting just thinking about it. That's such Ro a key detail. Rotation is how people escape. Right? They usually want yeah. to rotate, rotate in that with you. direction. That's less true of the inside heel hook, but certainly the outside heel hook. They want to rotate in the direction you would turn. The way you, you do it is you prevent that rotation. You take all the slack out of the leg, and then you hip in. Um, that's how Gordon Ryan and Eddie Cummings both teach it, and they're obviously some of the best heel hookers in the world. Yeah, it, it completely uh, kills that escape beat. And so much of grappling exchanges, as I start to see, it's all about beats. In, in, in a fight, too, it's all yeah. about beats. And if you can get a beat ahead of somebody, you know, uh, you can win the position, you know, uh, get a beat ahead of their escape, like you're saying, or I referenced heavy on the hands earlier when you make someone post on their hands. That means you've got it a beat on them, right? They're already a beat behind yeah. you now. 
Um, just little theories like that. That that was great. Great great answer. We also have uh, guys like Cool Thought at Zab Judah asking uh, for Tommy Sweet medical TRT. Uh, you already answered him there though. Uh, I did. <laughs> um, he's gonna have to get to get get closer to our age basically. Uh, and last question here. Um, no gi underscore Andrew at Andrew Grapp grappling, I think. Um, yes. As, oh, sorry. As we see more fighters, Robertson, Mitchell, the caucus crew, exploiting the meta and lack of layers in MMA grappling, what fighters do you see having success as the meta shifts toward submission grappling? Similar to how George M., I'm guessing Masvidal, had more success as the meta went towards boxing. Well, um, I'm not sure that the meta is switching towards submission grappling. Um, I think where the meta is right now um, in MMA, and, and you know, I'm sure most of your listeners know this, but when we say meta, we're talking about the meta game, right? Like yes. kind of the way that people are approaching things and playing. Um, I think that what you're seeing a lot of guys do is having what for us a hobby calls a 60 second guard, right? Like mm -hmm. if they get put on their back they're going to go crazy trying to, to get a submission or get a sweep for like 60 seconds or so. After that, they're going to start trying to work back to their feet quickly. Um, where So the, this notion of having longer series on the ground where you're, you're looking for submissions, I don't think that's really the case. And I think when you're talking about grappling from the top, um, guys have gotten so good at submission defense that when you're on top, it is almost always to your advantage to win the round by doing damage. If you can do enough damage to finish the guy, even if you're not really hurting him that bad, flurries from the top tend to get refs to stop fights. Um, you know, that's that's a, a great way to uh, to win the round, possibly 10-8 him, you know, especially if you get on top early. Um, or, uh, you know, and if you are doing damage, even if you don't stop the fight, you can make the the next round perfunctory, right? Like, look at a, at a fight like Luke Rockhold versus Chris Weidman, yeah. you know? Like, yeah, Luke didn't finish, and I, what was it, the it was either the second or the third, but when they came out for the, the next round, like, why Edwin was practically out on his feet because Rockwell had beat the shit out of him so badly. Would Rockwell have been better? Even Rockwell, one of the best submission grapplers in MMA, would he have been better served to go for an arm bar? No, because it's an all or nothing thing. Um, you know, I think the only real exception to that is um, rear naked chokes because you can do that while hitting the guy, right? Um, you don't have to sell out your position in any way to get a, to get an RNC. Um, but yeah, I, I would dispute the notion that the Met is going towards submission grappling. Um, I, think, I think what you do have are guys who are, good at both riding and punishing their opponents and submitting them. Um, and, and Habib's certainly one of those. I mean, uh, yes, he's a, not to get, not to extend this too much, but um, one of the first articles that I, that I wrote when I started writing about MMA is actually a, a three part uh, series on MMA grab on MMA guard passing for a bloody elbow, which highly advise you guys to check out. I, I stand by everything in that article. I think it was a good one. Um, but I talk a lot about Habib in that article and how, his game has changed over the years and how originally he was really just like throwing guys, but they'd get back up and then he'd throw them again. That's why he threw Abel Trujillo 21 right, times. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That was actually a bad thing because it meant that Habib wasn't keeping him down. Whereas you watch him fight um, guys now, even good grapplers like Conor McGregor, who is a good grappler for anybody who doesn't think so. He's actually quite good. Right. Um, Habib takes him down and he just immediately gets a leg ride and starts you know, passing his guard and walking his way up and doing damage. And eventually he does get him to turn and he, he chokes him, but he's not selling out any kind of position to get that. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think you're going to see any big change in, uh, in how guys play. Um, you know, I, I think we've, for the moment, at least pretty much settled on the, the way to MMA grapple. If you can, if you're good enough is you take the guy down, you keep him down, you beat the shit out of him while slowly advancing position if he turns away, you rear naked choke him. Um, but, you know, if he's facing you and his face is up, you're probably better served to keep elbowing him in the face. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. And uh, not only a great answer to that, hopefully um, we were able to answer the question as far as the metagame where grappling is going uh, in this podcast that we just recorded, Tommy, because I think we touched on a lot of things from traditional old school judo entries on, you know, getting the fight to the floor keeping the flight to the floor as far as how to operate from traditional guards or non-traditional guards, uh, right? And I think we're coming to this same conclusion that what you just said, I think that I would agree the metagame is moving away from submission uh, submissions and more toward wrestling, which was an, another reason why you stand and I stand so hard as far as integrating that for you grapplers out there, no matter what your 
perceived style is. And I guess the last thing I will say on that is that it's, it's funny because in that closed group I have, Tommy, most of these guys are all jujitsu or like they're not MMA people uh, for the most part. Some of them have fought pro actually. Uh, one of the brown belts actually is, is a really, really good pro. Uh, Bantamweight who may or may not have choked out Michael Chandler a bunch of times. But like for the most part, these guys don't watch MMA, right? So when we're yeah. grappling, it's hilarious. Whether I'm defensively, I'm always the guy I'm going for the wall and using the wall and stifling their game because their 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 mat wrestling, so to speak, falls apart when you involve the walls. And I'm not doing it on purpose. It's just because I analyze and watch so much MMA. That's all I watch. That it comes yeah. through in my style. And so when I'm offensive and doing well, I'm I'm wrestling guys toward the wall. I'm getting to ride positions or half guards. And I'm even like going like, what am I doing? What am I going to ground and pound you? And the you know my partner will laugh. We'll, we'll kind of joke about it. Like, why do you keep wrestling for ground and pound positions, Dan? Uh, but but it's it's that it's seeing that meta. I think. Um, worked so much itself out over these past few years, especially that I've been covering it in depth that I feel like it almost comes through um, in my, in, in my style as a, as a novice practitioner to the pros we're actually seeing do for real to do the damn thing. They're actually having to parse it out in real life. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that wrestling and top position and riding positions have, have come to prominence. Oh no, no, that's, I mean, that's why folk style wrestlers are so successful. Um, that and being the, the product of years of strength and conditioning uh, and mental conditioning through collegiate programs. But, yes. yes. Um, those, those two things. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, it is, it is the meta. You know, if you're, if you're looking at a prospect who's a grappling centric fighter and you want to know if they're going to do well at a high level, um, can they consistently get their opponents down? Can they consistently keep them down? And do they have ways to either consistently win rounds or finish fights? And if they can do those three things, which is it requires a combination of, of wrestling and jujitsu, um, they're probably a guy who can make their grappling work on uh, on almost anybody. Absolutely, Tommy. Any last words before we get out of here, sir? Thank you so much for joining. No, thanks. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the invite, Dan. It's uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, I would just anybody who hasn't, uh, please check out uh, thefightsite.com, thefight-site, s-i-t-e.com, um, and uh, check out our Patreon if you like our work. Uh, you get an amazing value um, for your uh, as little as three bucks a month. So, uh, and we're all very passionate about what we do. And we have, in my opinion, some of the, the best specialists writing about um, really any combat sport you would want um, from uh, left way to sumo. So, uh, you know, we got it all. Hey, you know, it, it, it's a uh, tough financial times, but you know what folks, three bucks, isn't that big of an ask. And uh, even me, I I'm not a member to many Patreons. I am a member. Uh, supporting these guys oh, is well, important. Oh, well, thank you, Dan. We appreciate it. No, no. Uh, supporting, you know, this kind of work is important. I appreciate your guys' work. It's not just hyperbole or bullshit because you're on the show. I really do appreciate your guys' work, particularly you as well, Tommy. Um, Thanks. Uh, it, it's great to kind of get to know you a little better to see where this fantastic and knowledgeable writing, where, where it's sourced from. It makes a lot more sense now. Uh, so thank you for coming on and sharing it with my audience as well, man. Really appreciate I'm very you. I'm happy to. Anytime, Dan. All right, it. follow him at Moy Cowboy at underscore M U A Y underscore K H A O B O Y. Follow this on the uh, Protecting Neck podcast podcast feed, Apple Podcasts, ratings and reviews. Say hello if you're watching us on YouTube. Like the video if you liked what you saw. Subscribe. Help my measly subscriber count, folks. Daniel Tom MMA, if you're listening to this on audio, want to go do me a favor. Of course, it's supported at mixedmarshallanalyst.com where you can find your Amazon and on it, click through banners, maybe a PayPal donation link. If you're feeling don uh, generous, want to keep this kind of stuff free, which I intend on keeping it free and coming to you. And until next time, protect your neck. All right. Thank you.